Hello, good morning, good afternoon, uh, depending on when you are. It's IoT Live, the first IoT Live, uh, and we are here uh, on Google Hangouts. Well, I myself, I'm in France, in Toulouse, uh, kickstarting the day with some demo sessions from uh, some great speakers. Uh, so we will have four demos today. Um, and we're going to start with Thomas. We're going to show you, uh, show, show us uh, a demo that's called Call My Arduino. Uh, David uh, is going next and is going to talk about IoT DB. And then uh, Tim Park is going to talk about the Nitrogen Project. And Vaughn from Tembu is going to make a Tembu demo. So, um, Thomas, I think you're all uh, ready to get started and to show us a cool demo about how one can call his or her Arduino. Yes, I am ready. Thanks for the introduction. Welcome. So, I'll try to share my screen. Yep, we can see your screen. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, so um, also thanks for inviting me to present here. One reason I'm here today is probably the International Internet of Things community. And since Christine Perret started the IoT meetup here in Zurich, we've grown to about 400 online members. Around 30 people are showing up uh, on a regular basis to our meetups. We organize presentations or meet in a local hackerspace called MakeArt Lab. There we do workshops or build IoT projects like the Oktoberfest of Things project, which is a collaboration with Mark Pose from IoT Barcelona and IoT Munich, where we connected beer to the internet and tested it at the original um, Oktoberfest. We think it's important to bring the Internet of Things to normal people in a playful way. Today's project tries to do exactly that. Everybody loves Arduinos, even more if they are connected to the Internet. But what about Grandpa? He hates computers and doesn't use the web. So we have to bridge this gap somehow. Fortunately, there's Twilio. This is a web service that turns everything into a phone. It's a REST API to automate phone calls hosted in the cloud. For a small fee, you can get a local phone number for your Arduino. Here you see that I have a Swiss phone number, plus 41. And every time somebody calls this number, the Twilio infrastructure asks you for a response, which it then reads out to the caller. The concept behind this is called webhooks. A webhook is an outgoing HTTP call to a URL of your choice. Our web webhook will point to the Arduino. You can see it here. It's already uh, configured. Unfortunately, an Arduino connected to a local network does not have its own public IP address. To make it accessible and addressable like a real web server, we need an additional service. You could use port forwarding for this, but this might be cumbersome to configure at home. Uh, and then something like uh, DNS to make your server accessible. Or you can use a relay service like Yaler, uh, which is provided by a company I started together with Mark Fry here in Zurich. Yaler enables web and SSH access to embedded devices behind a firewall, a NAT server, or a mobile network router. Here it enables Twilio to access the voice XML file on the Arduino from the cloud.
as an example, we use an Arduino with Ethernet, with the Ethernet shield, and a basic temperature sensor, the Temp36. This is like the hello world of citizen sensing. But instead of posting measurements to the cloud, it will read the current temperature to the caller on demand. So here is how it works. First, the caller calls the number of the Arduino. Uh, then Twilio asks the Arduino for a voice XML file. It does this whenever somebody calls this number, and the webhook call reaches the Arduino via the Yale relay. The Arduino reads the temperature and dynamically creates an XML file with the response. The content of the response is read out to the caller by Alice, a voice of Twilio's text-to-speech engine. Note that the cloud services do not know about each other. They use HTTP as a common language for an open Internet of Things. So the system is quite modular, nicely hiding away complexity behind simple REST APIs. Now let's look at the Arduino code. The first thing we have to do when using the Ethernet shield is to set the unique MAC address. You can achieve this by looking up the MAC address of your uh, computer and then just increasing it by one, for example, and hope that it's unique. Then, to use the Yale relay, we need the Yaler Ethernet Server Library. And finally, instead of creating a local server, we create a Yaler binding that uses a relay to become publicly accessible under a specific relay domain. Here, the relay is hosted at try.yaler.net. It listens to port 80 and it uses the relay domain Tamburg Arduino. All else in this code remains the same as usual with a local Ethernet server. In the setup procedure, Ethernet is initialized with DHCP and the server is started. In the main loop, we wait for incoming client requests. Then we skip the headers of this request by searching for a double carriage return line feed. And then we send the response. So this is the very basic parsing trick where you just more or less ignore the incoming request. And you assume that the request has a zero content length. Therefore, you just search for end of headers. And uh, once this client has been served, uh, the next client is served in this loop. Below, you see one such response in the server, uh, in the browser, I'm sorry. The Twilio XML format is called Twimmel and lets you choose the voice for the text-to-speech engine. Here, I chose Alice. The remaining part of the code is the send response procedure. It reads the temperature and converts it to a first to degree Celsius and then to an array of characters. Then it dynamically creates an XML document containing the current temperature in degree Celsius. And finally, it writes an HTTP 200 response to the client stream. Note that the content length can vary. That's the reason we have to store the XML document in a separate variable first. Uh, 
to get the content length header right. So that's all there is in terms of code. The web services Twilio and Yaler are just here. You can use them like a component, but you don't have to set up a server. They are just here when you need them. So how does this project map to a more general reference model of the Internet of Things? Here you can see our reference model where a user can interact physically with a device that has sensors and actuators, or he can interact virtual, uh, virtually through a computer or a smartphone because this device is also connected to the internet. You could say that grandpa interacts with a physical device, the phone, which is connected over the phone line to the Twilio web server. There is no virtual interaction for grandpa. That's what we wanted to achieve. He's firmly rooted in the real world. Uh, Twilio talks to a service API, in this case, the Yaler API. And now we have to switch the, the other side of the system. There you can think of the Arduino as the physical device, which has a temperature sensor and which is connected to the Yaler relay server. The user would be a developer checking the XML in a browser. So this would be the virtual interaction. Or he could also configure webhooks into a third party service API like Twilio. So here you have, I would say, the bigger picture. In case all this sounds too confusing, here's the link to the instructable with simple step-by-step -step instructions. So I wish you all a happy Internet of Things day, and thank you very much for watching. Th thanks, Thomas. Um, I have a, a quick question, actually. Um, when you showed the uh, the Arduino code uh, with the HTTP um, um, request with the variable XML content length, is there a chance that uh, in the future you would support other protocols than HTTP? Do you? I mean, we will have talks later today about CoAP and QTT. Do you think there will be protocols that will be more appropriate for that kind of use case? Um, yeah, I am a very big fan of HTTP because it's, uh, it has already proved that it is scalable and works well for distributed systems. And in this case, you need a very low latency response because uh, the caller doesn't want to, to wait for a long time for a response. So I would say for such applications, uh, HTTP might be a good option. But of course, you could think of other protocols, especially between the the embedded device and the relay. And there we are thinking about something like co-op, which uh, is also used by the, the Spark I.O. Yep. I got one laying around somewhere. And this would maybe optimize the, the, the number of bytes sent between the device and the relay. For the front end, it's, it's quite uh, good to support HTTP because everybody can speak it. Yeah. And of course, uh, messaging is a completely other thing. Uh, we see that you have use cases where you would prefer messaging and, and maybe asynchronous communication, but that would be yeah, just another, another use case. Yeah, sure. 
Okay, well, thanks a lot for your presentation. I hope uh, we will uh, see you for the rest of the day and that you will attend the rest of the, the talks and the sessions that we have uh, all day long. I'm really looking forward to, uh, to today, actually. And next is going to be David from IoTDP. David, are you there? I am indeed. Hello, welcome. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen right now, and then uh, I've actually expanded my demo just a tiny bit. Uh, let's see how this goes. There we go. I'm going to start my screen share of my slideshow. Are you seeing that okay? Yes, sir. Great. So uh, today I'm going to talk about IoTDB, uh, which is a project I've been working on since uh, 2012, the end of 2012, originally. Uh, it was an adjunct to a hardware product I was working on, but uh, as I thought about it, it became more and more important. Has my screen share disappeared? Oh, I see what's happened. Okay. So um, uh, as an adjunct to a hardware project, but as I decided, I thought the value was more and more within the uh, software itself. What I'm doing is we're using um, semantic web technology, uh, in particular JSON-LD. What we want to be able to do is, well, let me go through the demo. So this is me. So what is the IoTDB? Uh, the idea is uh, control the world. Uh, so we want to be able to say things like turn off all the lights in the basement, or heat the stove, or I'm going to bed, which is a whole, what we would call a bundle of things, which is, for example, if I'm going to bed, I want to turn off the lights, I want to close the blinds, I want to set the at-home alarm, uh, you know, assuming no one else is going to come in and out of the house, or even something like watch Apple TV, which would be turn on the TV, change it to HDMI 2, and then turn on the Apple TV. So what we want is a, is there's still really no good ways of doing this. Um, so what I want to come up with ways actually to describe how to do these things and then actually implement it in code. And what we're calling this is solving the basket full of apps problem. And the reason it's a basket full of apps is uh, a couple of months ago there was a post about the basket full of remotes, which is you have a television set, and I know this is a problem at home, even though this is 2014 and we're living in the future, is there is an array of remotes sitting on, on the couch. And depending on what we want to watch, you've got to push this and push this. They've got to be in a particular order and so on and so forth. And it's, it's just horrible. And with the Internet of Things, is basically what we've come up is we reach that exact same point which is we have a basket full of apps. So this is my IoT folder on my iPhone. And we have, you know, if then then that. We have Wemo. So this is Wemo is just turning on and off a switch. Uh, you know, Philips U is an app for controlling Philips U lights, so I have three of those. Um, and then there's a estimode is something for location sensitivity and stuff like that. But what we end up is in a situation where to control things, we have to have a thing for that, you know, we have to have an app corresponding to that thing. And that's not really where we want to be. It's what we really want to do is, is getting back to those original statements is turn off the lights or I'm watching TV. We don't want to be, oh, well, I'm going to go into my Wemo and, and turn off this Wemo light and I'm going to set the Philips Hue lights to some other brightness or color and so on and so forth. So, what IODTB is, it's a database, it's a whole system of things, but there's a, there's a website, there's a database, and there's a software component. Um, what the IODTB database does is it describes how to control things, uh, and we'll, I'll get a little bit more into that in a while, what that really means, what, thing, what it means to control things, or how to control things. What things are, and that, that's simply saying that, that um, you know, I have a, a television set, there's the concept of having a Samsung television set, set, and then there's the actual, the specific television set that's a particular model that's sitting within my living room. And then where things are, which is that the fact that the television set is in my living room. So this, this concept of place is incredibly important. Um, What I want you to take away today 
is IoTDB is not a new protocol or format. It's what its purpose is, is describe protocols and formats. This is really the high-level concept. Um, so, for example, if you look like at something like AllJoin, which is a big effort to create a uh, kind of a standard for the Internet of Things or at home, is they say, well, here's how you do this. Here's how you turn on television set. Here's what you do when the door opens. Here's how you open the door. I'm thinking that the, you know, the horse has left the barn on this particular issue. It, it, it's, we're not at a state where we're going to create a, a protocol like HTML anymore for the Internet of Things. So what IOTDB does is we describe how these things work. It describes you have a Wemo switch. What it is is that Wemo switch is actually controlling a space heater in the basement of my cottage. Or this U light is actually in my dark room and it has this particular purpose or something like that. So rather than dealing at things that it's a particular piece of a thing somewhere, it actually has a meaning, it has a context, it has a place. And with the code, we don't say a U lamp has to operate this way. We say, this is how it operates. And then what we can do is introspect these descriptions and say, well, the U lamp acts this way. So when I say turn on the lamp, it goes and figures out what it has to do in the Philips U world to turn that on. But if it's dealing with a Wemo, it will do it a different way. And this is all done using JSON LD, which is kind of a recent standard, semantic web. And semantic web basically means we're using URLs to describe things. What this gives us is infinite. Uh, expandability. So if we need to have new types of actions, new things to do, or if you have to come up with your own thing, say for example for a factory floor, it will let us insert directly into IoTDB because we don't say that we're restricted to a, uh, restricted to a particular vocabulary. Uh, I've added this section just a couple of minutes ago just because I know that uh, we have a little bit extra time here. Uh, so just going through some of the main concepts that are within the IoTDB is we have models, which are a shared description of things. And this is going to be on the iotdb.org website that we're just in the process of opening up. So for example, a description of a thing might be a Philips U is this, a Wemo, a Wemo is this, a Bluetooth smart pedal, if anyone ever particularly needed that, for some reason, will be described this way. And the reason it's shared is everyone's models is open to everyone. Um, and there's a GitHub model which says that if you have a description, for example, of a Wemo switch, but you really need it, you don't quite like the way I did it, or you want to add some annotation information, say where it's going to be purchased or something, you can actually fork that, just like in GitHub, add your changes, and then push the changes back to me. Or you can just use it for yourself and say, this is the way I'm going to actually use the Wemo. I'm not going to use the standard description. Uh, there's a concept of places. Uh, which is where I put my things, and it's uh, places are kind of data that's unique to everything to me. Everything in IoTDB is kind of account oriented, so I can say here's my house, and it's a very light structure, but it, you know, and it's very vocabulary driven. So things have a concept like there's a floor, there's a name of your place. So for example, uh, 377 Old Orchard Grove or uh, my apartment building, and then say first floor, my bedroom, and so on and so forth. And then on the website, devices, but in the code is called things, but really that's the actual thing. So, and we kind of bind all these things together saying, you know, this device is a Wemo and it's in the kitchen or whatever. Um, attributes, this gets into the semantic, uh, there is a short demo coming up, uh, so this will make a little bit more sense. Um, and I know I'm going in a little bit deeper, maybe the uh, this sort of introduction, but what attributes do is basically when we have a model of thing is description of what these things are is the attributes. So um, for example, and this is really the first insight I had was that you can describe most things in a home with a very set of very you know straightforward vocabulary. Things can be turned down or off, things have channels, radios have channels, TVs have channels. Uh, you know, if you're measuring things, there's temperature. Uh, because we can handle sensing a notification with this. We'll leave facets alone. Leave this alone. Um, so this is kind of the um, that's the broad overview of what IoTDB does and what we're trying to accomplish. I'm actually going to specifically show you now uh, this in operation on this page here. And I also tweeted this uh, online. Uh, but if you go to this page, HTTPS. Um, 
iotdb.org, uh, Playground Home, and you click on, and I'm just going to do this on another computer here too so I can play along at home, um, iotdb.org, Playground Home, is what we have here is what, because I can't show you the devices that are in my house, even though if you go to the IOTDB uh, blog, I actually have videos off a whole bunch of disparate devices all being controlled under a symbol and mechanism. Uh, but I want to show you here, um, we, we created this, this home simulator, which is basically just showing a whole bunch of different devices online um, um, that you, you, you can... Um, just so we can demo it without actually the physical hardware. Uh, so what I'm going to show here now is uh, some vocabulary things. So this is now, this is the, uh, you're seeing the slide turn on and off the lights. This is actually talking the io 2 to be vocabulary. So what the colon on means is rather than using whatever the device definition of something is, is we're going to uh, use the standard definition of on and in the vocabulary, that, that can mean things for different devices the way it actually talks to it, but we know that it's always this concept of being on. So if you're looking at the uh, website, and I'll flip to that in a second, I'm going to bring this up. Uh, so run up node. Uh, just give me one second here, guys. I am actually going to if you give me one second, I'm going to change my screen share to I am actually just switched my chain share to actually be in a node window, which is actually um, talking to this connected home. Uh, and now I'm going to actually start sending commands, so if you will be able to see these things actually interact uh, live. Uh, there's a lot of things going on here. Uh, it's using a RESTful interface, but then messages are coming back by MQTT. Uh, so I'm going to turn on every device at home by putting in this one little command here. Whoops. Things. Let me get one more command here. Sorry. There we go. So we have five things that this thing is controlling right now. Uh, and I'm going to turn everything on. So I'm just going to, and if you're looking live on the website, you'll suddenly see that things suddenly flip from blue to red, and that's saying that um, um, that they, that changed state on the website. The command you should be seeing it on your screen right now, as I said, things that set IoT on is true, uh, but we can also do um, something a little bit. We can do this. Let's say. Um, we want to turn everything off. We can just do that, say false, so on false. And if you're looking on the website, you'll be able to see that all these things suddenly flipped over to false. Uh, now, this, I know, understand there's an element that this is probably not too exciting because, oh, well, he's just talking to an API. But if these things could also be Philips used, they could be a custom Bluetooth low energy uh, switch, uh, they could be Wemos. And we'd be using exactly the same vocabulary that we're using here. We're typing in exactly the same commands. And we can even do more complicated things. So we can say that things with Playroom. Now, Playroom is something that we define in IOTDB, which is a room in the basement. Uh, you'll notice on the website that there's no thing called Playroom. It's actually a concept that we associated in IOTDB with the basement, a particular room in the basement. But let's change all those lights to yellow. Um, so I'm typing in this command here, things room playroom. So it selects a subset of the things that are the playroom and sends the command change the color to yellow. Now if you look at the uh, on the website, uh, it's you know they use the terminology RGB for setting the color. Here we're using the terminology color, which is once again the translations all handled automatically by IOTDB. So I'm sending that, and if you have a chance to pop over to the website. Uh, and I know I'm making you flip screens here. I'm sorry about that. Uh, you'll see that all the colors change to yellow. And then finally, the uh, this is a two-way street. So what we've done is 
Um, there's a large number of drivers we have. We have drivers who talk to Wemos. We have drivers who talk to Universal Plane, plug and play devices. Uh, we have things for talking JSON. We have things for talking general net type protocols. Um, and, and this came up a little bit in the last demo. On, um, is there's really three things you want to be doing in any of these interfaces, and, a, and REST and RESTful interfaces only get you two of them. And that is, you want to be able to you know, set things, and you want to be able to get things. Uh, but the component that's missing is um, notifications, which is when things happen, you don't want to be polling things constantly, saying, has something happened, has something happened. It's, it's really annoying. And so what we've done is, even though um, we've basically baked uh, smarts, in, in this is in the, it's not a requirement for IOTDD, but in our code, we baked MQTT in there to make it really easy to integrate MQTT messages if people want to do that. And in the future, we'll probably add co-op too. Um, but what that gets us is, uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to go over to the, the website and I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to change the state of something. I'm going to say, I'm going to take the U1 and I'm going to change the color to red, the solid red. And I'm, I'm just doing this actually from the website and I'm saying change color. And you'll notice on the screen over here that a message came in and the state updated automatically now. So the power of MQTP messaging. So this is all kind of built into the IoTDB code. Um, so that's the demo. Just give me one second now. I'm going to switch back to the slideshow and kind of get things concluded here. Screen share. Screen share. And back to my screen share. And you should be seeing my slides again. Uh, I'll make these slides available. And there's also copies of this on the website. Uh, this, you know, versions of this that we've been posting up for the last couple of days on IOTB on our blog. Uh, so you've seen the notifications. There's a lot more to IOTDB in this. Uh, I know there's a lot of ground cover here, but this is something really different than what you've seen before, even though maybe you're seeing the same functionality, which is we're trying to really take a step back from what everyone's doing and saying, rather than telling people how to do things, we're saying, let's describe what people do, and then through the power, and then present this semantically. So you can say, when you look around your world, and you say, well, it's one of these things. And you can introspect it and create interfaces without really knowing, having to know manufacturer-specific data, or having to perform this particular protocols, and so on and so forth. Uh, and I guess, let me just flick back to myself. Give me one second. Uh, I'll get back to myself. Hi, Benjamin. Can you see me now? Yes. Am I back? Oh, excellent. Okay, so uh, that's really the um, that's the run through of IoTDB. Uh, thank you very much for your time and the opportunity to show that. I know there was a, a lot of ground covered there, but hopefully it was insightful to some people. That was really great. So, um, so people should go check out iotdb.org, right? Yes, exactly. And there's a sign-up page on the front. We're just releasing a couple of accounts at a time because it is very alpha at this time. Okay, great. Well, thanks for for your presentation. So, um, while you were talking, Tim and Bon uh, joined us. Welcome, guys. So, uh, we, uh, you guys, have 40 minutes basically uh, to share between the two of you. Uh, so next is going to be Tim about the nitrogen nitrogen project. Tim, how about you just unmute your mic and get started whenever you want. Welcome. All right, great, thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you. I'm, I'm Tim Park, um, and today I'd like to talk a little bit about a um, a platform I've been working on called Nitrogen. Um, I forgot to share my screen. Hang on. Um, so Nitrogen is based on my experiences at Nest Labs, and it provides a platform for combining applications together into um, uh, devices and applications together into uh, into applications. So um, I'm going to take you through today a running through the application as if you're a new user. Um, so let's you know let's get started. So one of the things that Nitrogen provides is a command line tool. 
Um, so I'm going to use that right now to uh, to create an account with nitrogen. Um, and I'm just going to change and uh, choose a password. And I've created an account with nitrogen. Um, and so one of the features of nitrogen is it can auto detect new devices on your local network um, and attach them. And so we can you can use this to see that it's already found that I've actually attached um, a Raspberry Pi and another thing called the Cloud Reactor. Um, so at, in, in nitrogen, we have the concept of, of a reactor. And a reactor is something that can execute applications. And so in this, in this, uh, in this quick demo, I'm going to show installing an application to the Raspberry Pi that acts as a, um, a hub for the, uh, um, acts as a hub for the, um, uh, uh, for a Philips Hue light bulb. Um, and so let's uh, let's jump over real quick. Hang on, I share the right screen. Um, so the first thing I wanted to show is what an application looks like in in in, in JavaScript, or I'm sorry, in, in Nitrogen. Um, and so the first thing you'll notice is that it's written completely in JavaScript. Um, and so Nitrogen leverages uh, very extensively JavaScript in the JavaScript ecosystem. In particular, it uses JavaScript and Node.js. Um, and it does this because it's, it's one of the fastest and largest growing ecosystems in the world. And this allows a much broader set of, of application developers to tap into this ecosystem um, while building Internet of Things applications. So the, the Nitrogen application has a really simple uh, development model. Essentially, you have to implement two things. Um, a start uh, method, which you know is signaled when the the application is starting, and a stop method when it's when it's you know when you're asking it to stop. Um, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that I'm doing here is I'm I essentially when I start the application, I'm asking it to connect lights. Um, what that does is it actually just uses a node module from the ecosystem um, that somebody else has written. I didn't write this. That uh, actually knows how to interact with the Philips Hue bridge, um, introspect it for lights. And then and then and hook them in, um, and so I'm using that here in this connect lights function um, to essentially enumerate all of the lights, and then for each of them I create a um, a device principal for within nitrogen. Uh, a principal. So one of the concepts of uh, of nitrogen is that it provides a full authentication and authorization framework um, because we know that you know things that Internet of Things is, are very you know, uh, tend to be very personal and 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 can be life threatening and, and dangerous if, if uh, Used by people that don't have authorization, um, and so here I'm, I'm actually instantiating um, or provisioning this device within this, the, the nitrogen service. Um, so I connect it with the service. Um, this does all the provisioning, uh, establishes an authenticated session, um, and then I instantiate a light manager to manage the light. Nitrogen operates on um, uh, the concept of, of, of essentially message passing, and the way you could think about it um, from a, in, in a um, uh, a mental, you know, kind of the mental model you should have for it is it's sort of Twitter for devices. And so devices and applications send messages back and forth to each other, um, and that's the way they communicate through the system. This is a lot of nice properties, including that, you know, devices don't always have to be connected, but can, can connect, receive data, or, or receive commands, or send data, uh, and then disconnect it to save power. Um, so in this in this case, we're we're using a light manager to essentially watch this this stream of messages and control the lights and send back status. Um, and so that's kind of the, the kind of at a high level what an, a nitrogen application looks like. Uh, it's published in a Node.js's npm registry, just like any other Node module. And so you can really think about Node.js as being the app store for for nitrogen applications. Okay, so let's let's try let's install this to the um, uh, to the, hang on, let me switch back. Um, all right, so let's install this to the Raspberry Pi. Um, and the way you do this is just by issuing, again, I mean, it has a, it has a pretty full-featured command line tool. What I'm going to ask it to do here is to install to the Raspberry Pi this application that we just looked at. Um, and so if we look at the, you know, having done that, if we look at the state of the, the Raspberry Pi, you can see all of the applications that have been installed on it. Um, and so what we see is it's installed the Hue Bridge application. It, this is more or less exactly what you do if, you, if for people that are familiar with Node. Uh, it's, it's essentially just installed the module on the Raspberry Pi. Um, so let's start it. 
And what this is going to do is it's going to run that code. It's going to call that, that start function, whoops, sorry, um, that we saw in the previous example. And it's going to, uh, once it finishes starting up, it's going to introspect my local network and find the, the um, and find the, oops, sorry, uh, the, the, the hue lights that are on it. And so what we see here is it's done that. It's found, it's found three hue lamps. Um, and so now what we can do, looking, thinking about that, that, that messaging model that I talked about before, is we can actually, whoops, took too much of that line, hang on. Save a lot of typing, okay. Uh, we can actually start sending messages to that light. So here I'm going to, um, uh, I'm going to send a message to this light to tell it to change, change the color blue. Um, and all this is going to do is it's going to emit a message. Uh, the the nitrogen uh, uh, framework is going to, our platform is going to route that message through to the, the, the Raspberry Pi, which is going to relay it to the light. Um, and so I, I did that, and I am going to now switch back to, so you can see it, it's over my shoulder. Um, hopefully. Oh. All right, something strange happened with Google Hangouts. Well, trust me that the light over my shoulder just turned. There it is. So you can, I don't know if the, that the quality is very good, but you can see over my shoulder that the light is blue. Um, and so that's you know, an example of kind of round tripping and a, a complete thing. That's a device application that fielded the message, uh, affected a change on a, a, a particular um, principle in the system, and so everything's working. Now, obviously, this is not a great, you know, this is not the way you'd want to use, uh, uh, this is already pretty manual to have to send a message from the command line. Um, so now I want to show another application that takes advantage of this, of this light. Um, so, uh, the, uh, so, I, so today we're watching, obviously, uh, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of things going on with uh, Internet of Things Day. And so what I thought would be interesting would actually to be write an app that follows uh, the Twitter feed for IoT Day and changes the, the color of the light from uh, to red if there's more tweets and to blue if there's less tweets. Um, this has a, the application, uh, so I'm going to run this application in a cloud instance of the reactor. Um, the cloud has, you know, a cloud instance has the same interface, so it has a start and stop function. And here I'm just using it to set up uh, an application that follows the Twitter, the, the Twitter stream for hashtag, you know, IoT Day. Um, and then changes the changes the color of the lamp based on that. Um, this application also takes a set of parameters, so I need to pass in all you know a set of things that Twitter wants, the light that I want to control, and then this Twitter query, a set of measurement uh, uh, parameters. Um, it then you know sets up an interval that essentially updates the lamp. Um, and what that does is it does something that's very similar to what we just did on the command line. Um, it figures out what the color of the light the light should be, and then it sends a message, a light command. Um, to the uh, 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 to the lamp to 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 change its color. Um, so if I go back to the command line, oops. Okay, I'm going to do the same thing again. Um, it is install to the cloud reactor. This time, this one is actually running in the cloud, which has more resources and can it can have more uh, uh, obviously much more ambitious applications. Um, <clears throat> I look at the state of it just to make sure it's doing okay. All right, so it stops. And so we, now we just, likewise in the, the previous example, um, I'm going to ask it to, um, you know, to essentially start. Here I'm passing in, though, is the set of the parameters that we saw before. Um, and there's, there's, a, there's, a web, uh, there's a web version of this. This is just the command line for, for showing uh, in more detail what's actually happening under the scenes. Um, but you can see I'm going to I'm going to uh, change the color of the lamp based on IoT day, um, and uh, uh, that's to start implementing. And things are really active right now. And so what's happened? I'll switch to my uh, switch to yeah, great, thank you. Um, so uh, you can see that it doesn't really come through as well as I hope, but it's red. So many people are sending many tweets about IoT day. Um, uh, we can, uh, you know, we can see, you know, the, the, this this in action. If I go to, um, hang on, I jump over to the browser, 
Um, so you can see this in action. Uh, so obviously there's lots of people tweeting about this. Um, uh, I wanted to show off uh, So one of the things that, that nitrogen provides is oh good, okay, um, is a full uh, is a, uh, a web administration tool. And so we could use this to actually watch what's happening here. So here I'm watching in real time uh, a set of light commands being generated by this application being used to control this light. And so as it looks at this Twitter stream for Internet of Things Day, um, as new messages come in, it looks to see if the trends above and below the, the, the trend line and, and controls the hue of the light appropriately. Right now, the, 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 there's a lot of people tweeting, and so it's made it as red as possible. Um, that doesn't surprise me. Uh, 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 but you know that's that's essentially the idea um, that you could write these applications uh, that are either for the device that allow you to hook devices in uh, to nitrogen um, uh, or the applications that use these devices and they, they communicate over messaging um, so the message is the is the abstraction between these two things and so part of the nitrogen project is building up this vocabulary of, of um, is how of how we communicate between these things, having a kind of a common message schema for lights, a common co message schema for for uh, you know all sorts of objects, um, and so uh, you know I think that you know that's more or less my my demo for today. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, show you you can uh, so for more information about nitrogen, um, uh, you can go to nitrogen.io. Uh, we are an Apache two licensed project. Um, and and we you know the goal of nitrogen is to provide the infrastructure for making great devices so that you can really focus on building your application. Um, the project page here has a, a guide for getting started, um, so you can walk through this um, a, a, a similar set of, of, of steps that I've done in this demo for yourself. Um, it also has a set of documentation and, and, and links to the GitHub repo. Um, naturally, if you're interested in collaborating on the project, please reach out as well. We have a number of folks that are working on this. Um, and you can, uh, I'd love to hear, hear feedback. Um, please uh, uh, feel free to send me feedback on, on Twitter at Tim Park. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. It was awesome. Um, actually, we were uh, with Dave and Thomas using our uh, private uh, Google Hangouts chat. And I think Dave and, and Thomas might have a few questions for you. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Maybe not. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'll try to write a, read the chat here in a sec. Uh, okay, no. Yeah, so the Hue has its own, uh, yeah, so the, the, uh, the, so the Raspberry Pi is communicating via HTTPS with the, the nitrogen service, and then the Raspberry Pi is using um, the local uh, uh, Ethernet connection with the uh, Philips Hue's puck to then communicate over, over Zigbee uh, for, to, to control the lamps. One of the questions. Okay. Thanks a lot. That was no problem. Okay, well that's that's really cool. Um, so Can I, uh, just inject one question. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so what's the actual? I, I just I missed it. Um, so you're you're basically distributing and running processes on other machines, basically, right? And that's then correct. Yeah. And what what's the underlying messaging protocol that you're using to communicate with these things? Um, we're currently using a, a, a just JSON. Um, I, one of the, th the goals of, of the framework is to actually abstract that away, um, because I, I think I think the answer to that is going to depend on on what the capabilities of those devices are. Um, I think I think for for these kind of smaller devices, MQTT makes the most sense. Um, but I think we're talking communications between two very high capability devices. I think maybe there's something else that makes sense. So uh, from from a from a from a uh, framework perspective, we're trying to abstract that away. Um, but, it's, but just make, it's just making a, a channel then between you exactly. and exactly. Yeah. So okay. you, you operate you operate on these on these messages in a logical sense, right? So when you get them, um, they'll be you know JSON or you know some, whatever the language is equivalent of JSON is. Um, uh, but at a physical sense, I think we'll use the we'll use a protocol that makes the most sense between the devices in the service or device device or whatever. Right. Exactly. Cool. Okay, well, uh, thanks. Um, so I guess our next speaker is going to be Vaughn from Tembu. Hi there. <laughs> Hi, welcome. How are you? 
Um, all right, so uh, my name is Vaughn. I'm from Timbu, and uh, very happy to be here for uh, IoT Live. Um, so uh, basically, today I'm going to do a, a quick tour of, of what Timbu, Timbu does and how it relates to uh, IoT, the Internet of Things, and connected devices. So um, first I'll start off here by sharing uh, my screen. And uh, going to share my desktop. So hopefully that is all visible now. Yes, it is. Great. All right. So this is uh, the Timbu homepage. And basically what Timbu is is it's a way to program almost uh, anything, really, uh, any type of application or connected device in multiple programming languages. The way I will show this at the beginning is by uh, taking you through basically a tour of our library. So Timbu has basically built a uh, unique cloud-based platform that where a ton of different programming processes live that we have built. There's over 2,000 of these programming processes, and the way you can use them in your applications or on a connected device is you can test them out on our website see what they do, and then we will generate a production-ready code snippet that you can simply copy and paste into your code. And uh, the main, you know, there's over 2,000 of, the, of these processes. They're called choreos, which is short for choreography. Um, and they do things like they interact with over 100 different APIs. Uh, there's a number of different uh, sort of code utilities uh, that are available for you, and um, they also can interact with uh, databases and things like that. So this is the Timbu library page right here, and you can get a sense of, you know, here are all these getting started pages for working with Timbu uh, in different languages. Uh, we have SDKs for over eight programming languages, plus Arduino compatibility, plus uh, a REST API that wraps uh, everything in here if you want to program in, it in a different language or if you would rather not download an SDK. Um, along the left side of the screen here is a list of uh, all the different Corio bundles that we have. So they're for you know, all sorts of APIs, things like Dropbox or Google, Facebook, also kind of some interesting ones like data.gov, which has a lot of US Census data, uh, Daily Med, which has uh, uh, medication or drug information. Um, and the sort of idea behind Timbu is that once you learn how to use uh, one choreo, one process with Timbu, it's basically completely simple to use any other process. Um, so here I'll, I'll show you quickly like some of the things in the library, and then I'll walk you through how these processes work. Um, here's just a quick look at our u code utilities bundle. Um, so you can have Corio processes do things like authentication, data conversions, uh, send email from SMTP servers, uh, encoding, and the like. And then, um, but really, I'll show you how to do one of these. Uh, Timbu interactions. So I'm going to go down to Twitter here, and uh, I'm going to go into the tweets Twitter bundle and go to the statuses update uh, choreo. Um, basically, this is our way of uh, enabling you to tweet using the Twitter API. But as you'll see, everything is sort of uh, wrapped with Timbu, and it makes it very easy to use and, and basically put into your code. So here's uh, the page where we've uh, defined uh, all the inputs that you will need for uh, tweeting through the Twitter API. Um, you can see that the first four fields here are actually all just uh, different types of, of tokens or keys that you need. Thankfully, I've saved all of mine uh, with Timbu right here, wrapped into a single credential that I've named myself called Timbu Test. Um, and then at the bottom here is the actual content that I would type in for my tweet. So for today, I'll just type in hello with one exclamation point. And now I can simply click try it out here, and it will run the, the interaction from Timbu's website. 
uh, I scroll down the page and now I quickly can see what uh, the response from that API looks like. And then uh, down here at the bottom of the page, this is where it's very interesting, you can see here's the sample code uh, that I, I can use in my, in my program to make this same action happen. And I can literally just copy and paste this right into my code. Um, you can see right here there's this drop down menu, so if I want to do this in Python, I've got it in Python. If I want to do it in PHP or iOS, Ruby, Android, processing for an Arduino Yun, the list goes on. Um, so today I'm going to uh, do Java, and you'll see that the code snippet is actually quite short. Um, it's only really effectively about five lines of code, and the way that that works is that when you're using Timbu, we've basically you're calling the Timbu server in the cloud. Timbu is putting all of the interactions uh, together and then making uh, the, the call basically for you. And you can get a lot of benefits uh, from this, not only from the fact that we will continually update uh, the interactions on our end so that you will be uh, protected from any breaking API changes, but we can also do things like pre-parse uh, API responses and uh, give you ways to sort of more effectively offload uh, processing into the cloud, which is particularly important uh, when you're working with connected devices, which uh, may have limited RAM or a resource constraint in other ways. So um, I'm going to copy this code snippet right here. Um, I'm also going to go check actually this uh, Timbu test account um, to just confirm that my tweet came through. You can see, yeah, one minute ago I did tweet that hello, which you can see right here. Um, now I'm going to just open up a Java project uh, in Eclipse. Um, I basically have a line already here with just my Timbu account credentials. Um, and then I paste uh, the code in right here. Uh, I'm going to change the content of the tweet to just say hello again and add two exclamation points and run that uh, from Eclipse. And now it's running at the bottom here and in just a second uh, you should see that uh, it's now, yep, now it's just come right up on my uh, Timbu test account page, that tweet that I just did. So really um, that's how easy it is to use an API with Timbu. Um, and using any of the, you know, 100 plus APIs in our library or even the, the database interactions or code utilities is as simple as testing them on the website, figuring out how they work, and then copying and pasting into your code, which is really cool. Um, I myself uh, am not very familiar with the Twitter API directly, but since I use Timbu, I can do basically anything I want with it, uh, which is uh, really empowering and really makes building things quickly uh, very easy. Um, I'll walk you through a little bit here about, um, you know, kind of the work that we've done with uh, Arduino. Um, so we partnered with Arduino last year basically to work on the Arduino Yun, which was the first Ar Arduino uh, microcontroller board that had um, a Linux chip on it and basically internet uh, capabilities right out of the box. Um, and uh, we basically made it easy to do uh, call a ton of different APIs from the Arduino uh, Yun, and now we're working on increasing compatibility for the whole family of Arduino boards. And then beyond that, um, adding even more device capabilities for different device types to Timbu. Um, so here's just basically our Arduino Yun getting started page. There's lots of like great documentation here to basically get you making API calls for uh, interactions uh, with like in under 10 minutes. Um, so you know you can do things like log data to Google Spreadsheet or you know send email from your Yun and set up all sorts of different projects like that. Um, in particular, one very interesting thing that we've done recently is we've built out this feature in our library called the, de the device coder. Um, when we first launched, we called it the sketch builder, um, which two months ago we recently sort of updated it, 
and now we uh, refer to it as the device coder. Um, at the moment, right now, it supports uh, the Arduino Yun and the other Arduino boards, and uh, we hope to add more and more different types of, of hardware uh, in the future. So the really cool thing about this is, whereas the other uh, places in our library, you know, they'll generate um, and let you test out a, you know, kind of one interaction, one web service interaction, and, and put that uh, in your code. What the device coder does is it will uh, generate a complete program for a connected device so that, um, you know, literally all you have to do is set uh, configurations on our website and then a whole uh, program will be generated for you and you can upload that uh, right onto your device without actually having to write any code yourself. Um, but of course you can edit the code that we generate for you so you can learn a lot that way too. Uh, so if you, for instance, today I, I want to work with an Arduino Yun, I select that and I will get a selection of sensor types that I can uh, program. Uh, let's say right now I want to, I have a photo uh, cell connected to uh, my Yun, so I'm going to choose a light sensor and uh, I can now uh, set it up so that uh, a light sensor uh, reading will trigger any one of these actions here. So I can have the light sensor trigger an email, I can have it trigger uh, uh, logging data to a MySQL database, I can make, it, make a phone call, send an SMS spreadsheet, or use uh, Amazon SQS messaging. Um, so I'm going to do today, uh, make this happen by phone. Um, you'll get a sense here of like what are uh, basically this is how the page where you program uh, this interaction to happen. So um, I have first the selection here is what condition should trigger the phone call. I'm going to say if the light sensor value reading is below 200, um, I want to trigger the phone call. Uh, I have my uh, photo cell uh, hooked up to pin A5 of my board, and this is how you set it over here. You Click A5, and then you have this pin selector tool on the right. So I'm going to select that. Um, I have my phone number uh, here. That's the number I want it to call. And then my uh, credentials for Nexmo. That's the, the phone API that uh, the call will be issued through. Um, when I get the phone call, it's going to give me an automated message. Um, and I've just typed in, you know, hey, hey, Vaughn, it's getting dark over here. It'll give me the option to press one and turn on the lights, and I have an LED connected to pin uh, nine on the board, so I've got that right here. So I basically have this whole idea set up, so basically what I want is the photo sensor, whatever it gets dark, it'll give me a phone call and give me the option of turning on a light that's connected to my Arduino. Um, if I want to make this all happen, I can just click here and generate the sketch. You'll see that now there is this code uh, complete program for me to copy and paste into uh, the Arduino IDE. Um, I can also just download it right here directly, which is uh, a bit more convenient. Um, open up this file, um, and then I simply open up the program, and now the Arduino IDE will be opening up, and uh, here we go. Here's the, the sketch that I want. It all looks good. Um, I'll just confirm that I have the right board set up and the right USB connection. I'm going to upload the sketch to the board, and now it is uh, basically uploading the sketch to my Arduino Yun. And in a moment, I'll actually switch to a video feed so you can see me doing this in person. And then right here, you can just quickly see, I'll open up uh, the serial monitor on the Yun, and you can start seeing the, the light value readings that are being logged. Uh, you'll see that they're all above 200, which is the threshold I set for the call to be, set, for the call to be triggered on. Um, I'm going to quickly switch over here to um, uh, 
video of me. Um, so here we go. So you can see me again now. Um, here is actually the Yoon, um, and you can see that the light sensor is hooked up, and here's the LED. Here's my uh, phone that it should call. Um, and once I put uh, my hand over the light sensor value, it will trigger this phone call, or it should, if I can actually make it dark enough, which is proving to be somewhat difficult today. Um, and oh, it's actually very bright in this room. Um, so let me try this again. Huh. All right. Um, I'll quickly. Uh, I'm going to change the the setting so that uh, it doesn't have to be quite so. Uh, dark for this to happen. Pardon me while I re-upload this. Um, and uh, re-download a new sketch um, here. I normally don't do this uh, in, in such a bright room. And I, I miss Listed this. I think I should be ready to go now. Um, load this. Sorry about that. Uploading. All right, now we should be in business. All right, now it's triggering the phone call. I should get a phone call any moment. All right. So now you can uh, hear my phone ringing. All right, I'll let the I'll let the audio play again on the phone, but it's basically going to say, "Hey, hey, hey, hey hello, hey, Vaughn. It's getting dark over there. Press one to turn on the light." All right, so I'll press one to turn on the lights. Okay, your wish is my command. Goodbye. And I'm not sure if you can see, but the light actually just came on from me programming it through my phone, which is actually pretty cool. Um, and now it's going to keep calling my phone. <laughs> but um, basically, that's the cool thing about using uh, the Sketch Builder is that you can really um, make all of these sort of interactions happen very quickly. And uh, I'll switch back, actually, to my screen share um, for a moment. And uh, the cool thing here is that there's actually even a lot of things that I can change um, without actually having to re-upload the sketch uh, to the board. Um, for instance, uh, if I were to change the phone number that this was calling, uh, I could save that input. And since a lot of this information is saved on Timbu's cloud servers, um, I can literally start changing some behavior on the board. Uh, without actually having to re-upload a sketch. Um, that was a different case with uh, adjusting the, the sensor value threshold. Uh, but really what, what becomes possible is different ways of, of sort of reprogramming and, and uh, uh, reconfiguring the board uh, from the cloud without having to uh, you know, go in and dive into the code that's on, on the board. Um, so really interesting way that the oh, way that it works is, is it's just really hooking into this uh, uh, cloud platform and you get a lot of uh, sort of added added power that way um, and uh, that's basically uh, it, it for my demo um, we're so speaking of actual hardware there is a question on the chat from Anton 
Um, so you've demoed the Arduino Yoon. Uh, do you have plans to add new devices like wearables, for example? Um, we are, yes, so the, the answer is yes, we're planning to add new devices. Um, as for wearables, um, uh, I don't think we have specific plans uh, for a particular type of, of wearable right now. Um, I mean, we do have, you know, the Fitbit API and things like that in mm -hmm. our, um, in our, uh, uh, in our library, but, um, I think what, what we'll do next is sort of look into other uh, similar uh, devices that use microcontrollers um, and then also ideally be making a more uh, device-ready uh, version of our Python SDK, which will then be, um, you know, something that you could probably put on like a Raspberry Pi or, or things like that. Um, but uh, I think the, the ideal you know, our, our plan would be at some point to release an SDK that is more configurable for a bunch of different types of devices, so it might not be uh, exactly tailored for a wearable fight yet, but it could be, probably be easily configured to work on something like that. Okay, thanks. I hope uh, it answers your question, Anton. And maybe one, one more question from, from me. Um, Maybe, I mean, it goes further probably than I, pure IoT. What's the craziest thing that people built using combinations of, of uh, Tembu Koreos? Oh. <laughs> well, we've seen a lot of, like, especially interesting projects with, um, especially with using Tembu and Arduinos. Um, mm -hmm. I think a cool one that I saw just uh, last week was... Uh, a club at Yale that's doing beekeeping, and they basically hooked up all of these different hives uh, with a bunch of Arduino Unos, I think, but they all sort of talk to a master Arduino Yun, and they're recording all different types of, of data from each hive about weight, I guess, to track honey production and sound and humidity and temperature like that, and they're logging this all to, like, Google Spreadsheets and... Basically, I think from there they want to use maybe one of our mobile SDKs and create like a mobile app and, and add more and more hives. So that's like a really cool project I've seen. I agree. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks. Uh, I guess we will uh, we will wrap up. Um, so thanks to you all. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, Bon. Uh, we're going to be live again um, at 3 p.m. European time, uh, which is um, e, um, 9 in Eastern time for the actual um, IoT Live with panels. Uh, I mean, the first panel is going to be around open hardware, so it's going to be uh, it's going to be fun. It's going to be a different URL, right? So just go to iotlive.org and check out the the right URL for the um, the, um, the the event. Um, it was really great to have you guys, uh, live demos, it's cool, uh, command line demos, Arduino demos, I love that. So I hope you enjoyed it as well, and um, yep, we'll be back live in about 15 minutes. Thank you all. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs>